Today, we're going to do something a little bit different than usual. Typically, when I do interviews, it's with historians who study esotericism and magic in an academic setting. So, people who research these subjects in an attempt to better understand the past on its own terms. Today, however, I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to a contemporary practitioner of astrology and astral magic, Michael Offick, someone who studies astral magic not just to understand the past, but to understand the self and its place in the cosmos. Our plan is to dive into some of his personal experiences with astral magic in an attempt to explore the subject as a modern, living tradition still practiced around the world. So, sit back, relax, and join me in this fascinating conversation with my friend Michael Offek, with whom I've had the pleasure of collaborating recently, which we'll be discussing at the end of our meeting. So please stick around for that. You can find more information about Michael at hermetic-astrology.com. Michael Offek, Hermetic Astrologer, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. And I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, so let's jump right into it. So what is astral magic and how does it differ from other forms of, of magic? Technically speaking, you know, as the name suggests, uh, astral magic is a type of magic which harnesses the power of the stars, planets, luminaries, which were considered, you know, primary ontological causes for virtually all earthly phenomena. So in, in that sense, all types of magic sort of tap into these powers in, in one way or another. But uh, astrological magic goes straight to these forces, in a sense. And by so doing, they, they're utilizing very primal spiritual generative powers of the cosmos and nature. And because this form of magic is based on the astrological sciences, uh, it has the ability to time the ebbs and the flows of this cosmic powers. And, and this is... Uh, this is mostly done through the creation of astrological talismans. Uh, this is sort of the hallmark of astrological magic. Um, and that serves as uh, mimetic receptacles of the intended planetary power uh, to help direct it and manifest its potential in the world. But this is sort of the sort of the overarching description of what astrological magic is and how it differs from other types. Um, but for me, and at least this is more emphasized in my approach, astral magic is first and foremost the art and science of cosmic alignment. It is the alignment of one's will and action with the enveloping cosmic flux. This is what Ficino is called, you know, making one's life agree with the heavens. And this is, in my opinion, the essence of this practice and its deepest aim, you know, in the heart uh, and the roots of the tradition. And you can see that, you know, in, in other ancient traditions, which sort of um, have the same sentiment, you know, the, the perfecting of the self and the soul through the mirror of the heavens. Because in a sense, the starry heavens was considered sort of the eternal and ethereal aspect of the cosmos. Uh, and to certain um, sources, uh, they were also the homes of the soul. The soul came from the stars in a sense. So it's that yearning to return to the stars or regain that inborn celestial connection uh, what may be called uh, in some hermetic circles, uh, becoming a stellar man, in a sense, sort of rising up to that inborn uh, aspect of a nature. So for me, this is really the, the most essential aspect of what astrological magic is. And, and talisman making is sort of a more practical, focused uh, uh, application which I think during the tradition and the transmission of this tradition over history took more, most of the emphasis, really. Uh, and I think it gained this popularity 
uh, owing to what it promises, you know, the practitioner, which if, as you know, in, in such grimoires as the Picatrix and others, it's mostly desire fulfillment, you know, for power, control, you know, quick fixes of things. And so, you know, that's probably the reason why it became sort of the main aspect of astrological magic uh, is the creation of talismans. But I think at its at its core, it's more of an initiatory path and a path of self-perfection and and a path of uh, of recognition of the ebbs and flows of the cosmos and, and the way they influence um, the soul. So the Greeks had this concept of dividing time. They had Kronos, which was more of a like a linear serial reckoning of time. And then they had Kairos, which was the idea of the opportune time, the right time to do an action. And would you say that astral magic is an encounter with Kairos? I think that's absolutely correct. I think that uh, astrology in its core is the, uh, how can you say, it's like the ability to see the Kairos, in a sense, to, because the Kairos is, is more qualitative, in a sense. It's the changing of qualities um, and not only that sequential element of, of time. So, you know, in order to really see the opportune, uh, the opportune moments, you need to, uh, you need the ability to differentiate these movements, understand their qualities. Uh, so I think astrology is all about Kairos in that sense. And of course, magic is, you know, is taking the, this tool of differentiating those power moments of alignment and, and using this uh, opportune time to engage in something, create something, uh, do a sort of action under that time. Um, so, yeah, I think that's absolutely correct and, and a beautiful uh, distinction. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in astral magic? Well, I always had... Uh, you know, an eye for the mystery, uh, sort of motivated by my own existential uh, crises and contemplation very early on in life. So that sort of led me to explore many mystical traditions and uh, and also many different, you know, altered states of consciousness, shamanic journeys, meditation, and things to also explain my own spontaneous mystical experiences and out-of-body experiences, etc. So this was, I know that's a bit general, but this was my motivation to sort of understand the workings of the cosmos, putting it simply. And then I found astrology. Uh, but I wasn't satisfied with the modern articulation of astrology. Uh, and when I found the ancient sources, so in a sense, I, I felt that I, uh, you know, I, I hit the jackpot, you know. And then for more than two, two decades, I was obsessed in reconstructing what I could on the underlying uh, sort of cosmological and philosophical underpinnings of, uh, of this tradition, of this wisdom. And from that, I stumbled upon zoological magic. And that sort of uh, completed the picture for me uh, because there were many things in the philosophical schools and sort of the esoteric schools of the time uh, giving you the basis and the structure, but it didn't go down to those nuances of how the workings of astrology interact and shape phenomena. You know, uh, uh, and and astrological magic sort of has has to do that, has to explain that, because that's an operative aspect of what it does concretely. So, you know, it's it's in the astrological magic tradition that I found the at least that attempt to rationalize how these influences 
you know, incarnate into matter and 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 propel it and move it. And of course, the ways by which one can participate and navigate through this uh, and create things with it, which is a uh, sort of a proactive aspect of astrology. Um, so I've been researching and I've been experimenting for for many years. And it has become my, you know, my uh, my spiritual path, really. You know, the, this is my magnum opus, in a sense, to live and embody this uh, this wisdom. But you know, I am a modern person, and we are living in a modern uh, society, and um, and things need to renew themselves and they need to develop and they need to find different platforms and models to sort of integrate new knowledge and new understandings. So I feel that's also a part of my path. Um, it's not only, you know, trying to excavate those central principles of, of these wisdom traditions, but also to reconfigure them to fit the uh, modern times and modern needs, and also the modern, uh, more scientific perspective that has a lot to offer. Um, so this is where I stand with uh, with this ancient wisdom. So um, when do you yeah. think that astral magic began as a practice? Well, I think the the deep origins of what became astrological magic is rooted in prehistorical times. I would even go as back as, you know, the, the earliest fascination and cultural interaction with the night sky. And you can see this all around the globe, of course. And these were ancient sort of animistic cultures. Uh, and they were, uh, first of all, they didn't have any light pollution you know they were relying on on the light of the moon for instance to see at night and they experienced the heavens in a way that we cannot today you know the only way you can experience that is going you know to a middle of the desert somewhere uh, so they had a very powerful and profound direct experience of the sky and they followed the stars and their cycles observing them uh, deifying the planets, praying for their guidance and support, you know, making petitions, offering sacrifices. Uh, in a sense, this is probably what was led uh, to the source of most religions, in a sense. The worship of luminaries, the worship of the sun. I think these pagan and shamanic traditions sort of seeded the roots of what has become the more complex and rationalized form of astrological magic, uh, and the sort of the earliest form of the magician, which is in a sense the shaman uh, or the priest, you know, or the healer or the mystic or the oracle, you know, it's sort of all converging to that archetype of the one that has the gift of vision, the ability to engage with spirits and deities and affect change in the world. Um, and I think this is the point of being a bridge, you know, the bridge of the unseen and the seen, the bridge of the heaven and earth, you know, that's kind of where the astral magician uh, sits. Uh, so this, I, I think, is sort of the earliest, you know, ground by which um, uh, astrological magic goes to a very deep past and a very sort of archaic um, nostalgia of very, very early people. And simply put, I think the this these uh, shamanic culture, uh, which I think is becoming increasingly clearer today, uh, had an immense influence on classical antiquity. Orpheus was probably the most celebrated shaman of the pre-classical times, uh, with sort of most of the motives you would find uh, going to the underworld and coming back and different, you know, other motives and the use of music and being the son of Apollo. Uh, control over wild animals, control over yeah. the gods with, with his music. Yes. 
And I think it's also the, the uh, has one of the most earliest accounts of ceremonial magic, uh, doing some sacrificial thing. So he was sort of an archetype of a shaman and sort of a, a mysterious uh, mystic. And uh, I think that this is sort of the core of of magic in general and astrological magic in particular as you know these types of more engaging direct experiential shamanic aspects were probably more prevalent early on before they were later rationalized and became more systematic and scientific and in a sense and you can see that you know that we there's a lot of instances of that there's the cult of Asclepius and the healing temples and the the Atramantis, you know, the healers there, which were also astrologers to a very large degree, and they had their, you know, um, their, their places of incubation and getting into altered states and sort of a kind of shamanic journeys uh, to contact the gods and get revelations and get remedies for their ailments or whatever. The more more recent theories coming up, for for instance, uh, Peter Kingsley's. Um, uh, um, argument that uh, of that basic shamanic influence at the at the, at the heart of uh, of the Western tradition, in a sense, uh, um, given right. the for account of who, uh, yeah. For those who don't know, Peter Kingsley argued that pre-Socratic philosophers like Empedocles. Uh, are more easily understood through the lens of something like a shaman because he was into all of these incubation practices and very profound ecstatic out-of-body meditations. And that's something that typically gets written out of the history of philosophy, even though in terms of the history of magic, Empedocles, or at least pseudo-Empedocles, is at least recognized for for these kinds of revelations that is mm -hmm. that the whole world is made up of love and strife or, or attraction and repulsion made up of these kinds of cosmic opposites yes yes and you know th these have counterparts in astrology too you know he calls love aphrodite really which is you know venus in a sense and strife of course is more connected with mars so he's you can say that he's uh, that might be you know a uh, uh, sort of a later interpretation, but he's sort of talking about these sort of archetypal forces. Uh, one is more uniting, and the other is uh, separated. But but yeah, Peter Kingsley argues that he's essentially a sort of mystical magician, and they were all sort of uh, all the pre-Socratic philosophers, or most of them, uh, with uh, emphasis on Parmenides were delving into these non-rational, quote-unquote, realms uh, of spiritual encounters and mystical experiences and uh, a very shamanic motive there. So there's the account of Abaris, the Skywalker, uh, coming from Hyperborea that, you know, imagined paradise realm in in the north, sort of teaching Pythagoras uh, his wisdom and sort of giving him the initiation to a degree. Um, so there's there's a lot of accounts on this, and and you know this is also the place when our interests sort of converge uh, because you have done a lot of research on this uh, and have studied this extensively and. So there's the you know the ancient mystery cults, of course, also connected to Orpheus and Dionysus and mythological um, ecstatic gods. Yes. So the the point here is that there is an, a powerful needed emphasis on the ecstatic element, on the direct experiential engagement with these powers. And you can see that also um, building into the theurgical doctrines, uh, the, the Chaldaic and the um, and the Umblicus's sort of integrated theurgy 
that there is a need to sort of put aside the the rationale and embody that communion, embody that connection, and uh, sort of um, in that way connect to these deities, these spirits, these powers, which are sort of encapsulated in the to the astrological cosmos. Uh, I feel that this is, in a sense, the roots and also the needed element that is sort of missing from the way that astrological magic is practiced today. And I think uh, from at least a very big part of history, too, um, because it, it became a sort of a technology of how to tap into a certain power and uh, and use it to your own gain. But the emphasis on more of a, um, an internal work, which is which has to do with altered states of consciousness, for instance, to get into that mode of communication, which is not really easy in, in your ordinary kind of, uh, you know, of consciousness. Uh, so this is a big part of what I think uh, should be reintegrated into astrological magic. And this is something I've been doing and working on for many years. So in a sense, uh, I believe that these ancient shamans uh, were working with, you know, they were working with the spirits of nature and the spirits of the luminaries and the planets and certain uh, certain constellations, and you can see that still in many shamanic cultures around the world. But probably upsurge of intellectual disassociation that happened, you know, in the West, and uh, yeah, kind sort of, of mathematization process that made it more about calculations and crunching numbers and things like that. Yes, and putting it all in the head, in a sense, you know, sort of, uh, which, which is probably the only place that these philosophers or or scientists felt secure, in a sense, because the 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 dimensions of the more, you can say, experiential, emotional, ecstatic, inspirational, non-rational types are fleeting from the ability to comprehend and articulate and systematize. So in a sense, they they stayed where they felt comfortable, which is, you know, negotiating, philosophizing, but not doing the direct work in a sense. And this is a this is also a criticism that Iamblichus uh, has of certain type of philosophers. So I think that the the direct experience element is uh, is very very important. Now, to talk about more specific aspects of where astrological magic originated, for instance, there was the practice of telestike, which is the installment of statues, and this is probably very very uh, very very early. Could have had probably Egyptian roots. Babylonian roots, and there, you know, most of the principles that you have for talisman making are are already there in a sense, um, putting into the statue the different corresponding elements from uh, the natural kingdoms, either the plant, the gems, the metals, the, the names, the different symbols, different characters. All of these are sort of sort of compiled to make a, re- a receptacle for the god and for that statue to do a certain thing, either you know guard a place or give epiphanies or uh, you know many different types of things. So this is probably also part of the origin of the specific, more specific technical elements that became part of the astrological magic tradition. Uh, and you can follow up on many of these, but again, the emphasis on uh, ex- 
the expansion, in a sense, of your consciousness in order to commune with these elements, in order to draw them, that's an emphasis that needs to re, uh, how do you say? Um, um, it needs to be reinserted into the tradition. Yes. It's certainly part of the Hermetic Asclepius, where you get this union of the more Gnostic element of filling your mind to the brim with so many good things that there are no longer so many good things. There is only one good thing, and that is the uh, awareness of divinity that is discussed in the opening chapter of the Asclepius. And then it's only later on in maybe about two thirds through the work where you start to get discussions about embodying the gods into statues, about combining stones, plants, and uh, minerals, and those kinds of things into these receptacles for soul, for the souls of the gods. So yes. um, we see that from about the second and third century, that element still was pretty strong, or that union of the two factors, the more experiential, and you could call it Gnostic factor. I don't want to say that in the sense of the the Gnostic movement, but in the sense that there is a an emphasis on Gnosis, yes. in addition to the talismanic element, and not a de-emphasis of one over an emphasis of another. Yes, exactly. And uh, that's the point that if you look at the all the corpus hermetica, you, you can't really separate the technical hermetica from the theological one or the, you know, the um the spiritual need for salvation or you know or it doesn't mean you need to agree with the um with the aim of of the hermetist in the sense of leaving this awful place uh material uh world right though that depends uh, on the the text that you're looking at right, right some texts right. have that others don't and there is no cohesive unity of of the hermetic texts yes yes that's true but you know i'm, I'm saying that because some may feel that this is a sentiment of of uh, of the hermetists uh i feel differently but um you know in a sense i feel that the ascension through the spheres and the um in a sense the yearning to perfect the soul needs to be done in this world yes so it needs to be done embodied uh, and this is the real bridge between the powers of heaven and and their uh, reflection in the earth so in a sense the the reflective mirror of our bodies of our minds need to be clean to have a better reflection and a more stabilized expression, more balance, stab uh, uh, or I would even say noble, if we take a more of an alchemical uh, model, uh, sort of separating the, the, the fine from the gross. So in a sense, it's, it's sort of fine-tuning the maximum potential of the soul while in the body, while in the world. Uh, this, I feel, is the sort of the work um, of the hermetist or the theurgist. Um, but, you know, going back to mm, the definition of astrological magic uh, and, and my approach to that, um, I think this is really the... The, the deeply spiritual aspect of the science, because it's aimed at, as I said before, you know, it's aimed at the perfection of the soul in a sense, which probably cannot be, you know, totally perfected while um, inhibiting a body. But, you know, that's the sort of the, the drive for the betterment of your life, the drive for... Um, a better reflection of the forces that uh, make up your soul, uh, or in a sense, make up your soul, uh, but draw from the soul of the cosmos, in a sense. So 
it also makes you a more conscious part of the movements of the cosmos itself. So it so these this is somewhat less emphasized in in the modern practice of astrological magic uh, that the aim is to become a living talisman yourself, to become a living talisman of the cosmos for the maximal fulfillment of your soul's potential. And in a sense, that's reflected in astrology as that each one of us has its own individual image of the cosmos as, as its own seed of being, in a sense, as its own contract with the world, you can say. So it embodies certain co-mixtures of these celestial principles. Uh, and uh, and in a sense, this is your talisman. This is your potential. And the more you recognize these powers and uh, association or connection of these powers with the, the cosmic powers, you can say, or the ebbs and flows of astrological forces, then you become conscious of of your ability to navigate and potentiate these connections and draw upon them and become somewhat more than only your personal ego to a degree because you're you are participating in something bigger uh consciously and not just like a, a puppet on a string in a sense uh a, a victim of your culture or a victim of your uh, you know, uh, whatever the body necessitates of you. Uh, so it's sort of waking up to your innate nature and your intimate innate connection with these powers, uh, these powers that are signified by the planets, because in a sense, the planets are not powers per se. They are only like ambassadors of these powers. You know, it's they they also are participating in a cosmic pattern so uh, they they're not the 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 influence does not emanate from them in a sense they are um, um monadic powers which are themselves sort of participating in a cosmic order to a degree they're not one that is making this order uh, uh a bit like how the um the hands of a clock are not time they only you know they only show time so if you look uh, uh in this way at the cosmos so uh, everything as plotinus says you know uh, everything is breathing together so in a sense uh we are all um Everything in the cosmos is under the same patterning. It's under the same laws. But it's really hard to differentiate them within your soul. You know, it's much more easy to see something external, which you can uh, calculate and you can measure and you can, you, you can predict its movement and its interconnections with other planets, et cetera, et cetera. And then you, you have... Uh, uh, the ability to differentiate those different powers, which are also existent in your soul, and I think this is the this is the the important emphasis here, that it is all reflected in your own soul. So, as you're doing this work, you're also doing in powerful internal work of. Uh, mitigation and alignment and balancing of these natural powers within you. Something that uh, I find very profound about astral magic is this recognition that all things are images, self-projecting images, self-projecting images, self-projecting images in a long, endless chain, maybe not endless, stretching back to the one, if you will, but it's it's a, a philosophy of images and also a philosophy of images that can harm and that can heal and that mm -hmm. we as our bodies are images which project images 
can produce healing and harmful images as well. And I think that that is really one of the ways of affecting changes in the world is through the embodiment and projection of of images. And mm-hmm. I find that that is something that Platonism discusses to some extent, often about the harmful nature of images. So, for example, Plato kicks out all of the poets from his Republic right. because they make images that are less perfect than the reality. Um, but in this case, we're talking more about using images in a in a healing fashion or in a constructive fashion. And I find that to be a very fascinating aspect about the tradition. Yes, I I agree with you. And, and you know, some would argue that Plato's uh, account of the poets, uh, for instance, is not um, is not because they're making images in a sense, but because they're sort of relying on the fake imagery of corporal reality as a reality. So, in a sense, the the uh, the highest works of art are relying on reality as an image of the divine or as an image of, and in that way, uh, do tap into the sort of the archetypal imagination of, of the cosmic soul to a degree and, uh, and, and do not rely on corporeal world as, as a reality in itself. So there's a sort of, uh, um, an ambiguous element there because other places of Plato, he does put an emphasis on this um, on this side of sort of a mantic, poetic uh, uh, yes, art. Poetic. Poetry is one of the four forms of madness, along with right. love and prophecy and um, what's the other one? I think uh, mystic initiation. I think is yes. one of them. Yes. And in a sense, you need to have a certain madness to to get out of your head, to to connect with something bigger than you. And this, again, is the sentiment of that sort of ecstatic, shamanic, oracular element of the soul, uh, which one needs to sort of activate in order to really get into communication with these powers. So... What are some of the most common misconceptions about astral magic in the modern world, and how do you address them? Well, uh, about astrological magic, I, I would say the overemphasis on elections, and for those who don't know, elections is the is the art of timing astrological moments um, in order to uh, initiate something un- under that time uh which you know if if we only speak of astrology this is maybe the most magical branch of astrology uh the election of astrology so everything has a uh, you can say a more ideal timing uh for it to manifest in the way that you would like it. um <clears throat> so there's a lot of emphasis um on election as if this was the most of the work, in a sense, you know, finding that ideal time. And of course, this is important, but uh, it takes the emphasis somewhat out of the practitioner himself, in a sense, uh, because it, 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 it sort of gives the perspective that the, you know, m- most of the magic is condition to the astrological time. And I would say that, uh, you know, I would put much more emphasis on the practitioner and the set and the setting and its state of mind and its ability to uh, get in touch with these powers and sort of channel them and embody them and charge himself at that moment. And I would put much more emphasis on that than in the, on the election itself. Uh, so it's not that the lectures are not important, but again, this is a very, very uh, rationalized element of the work, you know, because it's really hard to predict what an astrological configuration would 
manifests too. You, you're going by the rules and you, you try to put aside most of the things that can interfere, but there will always be something that would interfere. So there's really never a, an ideal time. The, what makes an astrological magic powerful is the ability of the practitioner to um, sort of uh, focus on, on the needed or the wanted uh, power, the wanted planet, the, the hierarchy, or the spirit, or whatever you name it, um, and channel that power. So the issue at hand is that it's not that electional talisman making is is bad in any way. It's actually quite important to the tradition. But it's yes. that um, if we overemphasize the orthopraxy, the element mm. of doing things correctly in accordance with instruction, we may de-emphasize the element of the practitioner's will such that um, if we were to overemphasize too much the element of following instructions, an AI could theoretically build a talisman factory and produce an endless number of talismans. And you are skeptical <laughs> about that for good reasons, because it doesn't engage the will of the practitioner, which is an essential component. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you, you put it uh so good yeah um some practitioners that believe that the 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 doing something under under a certain astrological time is enough even if the practitioner is not present so in a sense as you said if it's 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 a machine that uh does it uh, under a timed astrological alignment that should be sufficient for the talisman to uh, have its, um, you know, its intended power. I disagree with that uh, very emphatically. I think that, first of all, I think that astral magic happens in and through the soul. I think the soul, in a sense, is the bridge. The soul is the magician. It is the creative power and the motivation and uh, and the mediating power, uh, you know, the mediating the form and the matter in a sense. Uh, so it is what is acting as the creative engine. This is very clear in Plato's Timaeus and in the Asclepius as well, that the, the world soul is created when the demiurge takes a portion of what is eternal and unchanging and mixes it with what is changing. Um, and th from that arises the world soul. And so there is an affinity between the eternity beyond the stars and the the place of the soul. They have this essential connection. And I don't think that we can do without that, um, at least not according to the the important texts like Plato's Timaeus and the Asclepius, both of which are quite fundamental to, to the tradition. Yes, yes. And if you go through, you know, later um, philosophers and later texts, um, you see the emphasis on the soul in a sense. For instance, um, I don't remember his full name, but uh, El Razi, who wrote about the Sabians and their tradition and their techniques, and he, uh, you know, he just... Uh, very straightforwardly puts the, the the whole power of the operation of the uh, astrological magic uh, to the soul itself and to the ability of the individual soul to associate with the cosmic soul and the constituent of the cosmic soul which are the planetary powers and if you if you take the the Timaeus example you know if you follow what you said uh, a few more steps, then Plato speaks, of course, that every soul has that same and other sort of melded within it. But he also says something that is very relevant, because he says that uh, after he's speaking about the movements of uh, the same and the other through the cosmos and the, the planets and the uh, what is called primary movement and secondary movement, planetary movement and the 
the earth is movement in a sense. Um, you get a kind of astrological he, system out of it. Yeah, but what he speaks, he says that the soul that is incarnated is sort of pushed and pulled by these powers. And what the soul needs to do in order to regain its uh, sort of balance is to synchronize the inner orbits of his psyche with the orbits of the cosmos in order to sort of align to it. And again, this is the, the, the sentiment of aligning with the cosmos, aligning with the orbits of the planets as they are reflection of the sort of the orbits within the soul or the orbits of the mind. Uh, and this is the way to sort of differentiate same and other to a degree and regain a sort of spiritual maturity and connectedness to the cosmos and to our origins, in a sense, um, a non-physical origins. So uh, you can't bypass that, in my mind. Uh, it could be that a talisman, you know, uh, made by an AI under a certain time uh, will have certain natural powers just by the fact that it was created under a certain time. But it will be, and I've experimented with this uh, quite a bit, it will be null uh, in comparison to uh, a magically charged talisman made by a practitioner uh, that knows how to control his mind and his flux of energies. Uh, That's and, what the Pegatrix uh, says. It says talismans that are made with the with the will of the practitioner engaged are more effective. And so it implies mm. that that perhaps it would work if it if it was made in some sort of automated process or or perhaps made by another person. But but less but less powerful. But sense. less powerful. That yeah. that's what the text says, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also another places where there are quotes such as uh, you need the um, the living fire of a person or uh, to engage in the production of a talisman. <clears throat> uh, the elemental fire and also a fire of a person or even an animal or something, you know, but you need a, a sort of a living entity there to mediate the creation of the talisman. And part of my sort of philosophical argument for the archetype of the magician is the demiurge itself, himself. You know, mm -hmm. In a sense, the magician is like the demiurge. He sees the model and he makes a talisman of it. So mm -hmm. the demiurge, in a sense, he sees the one as the model, uh, the old, beautiful, the absolute, and he makes the world as an image of the one. So and he sort of breathes life into it. So he's, uh, and of course, the, the word demiurge is um, um, an artisan, a yeah, craftsman, craftsman, sorry. Artisan as well is a good translation. Yeah. So the, the uh, astrological magician is the craftsman that needs to bring, breathe life into its creation. You know, and that's in a sense another sort of sub-image of the creation process at large. So each one of us is sort of a mic micro demiurge with the ability to impart uh, life to things, to animate things in a, in in some essential way, uh, even things that you know are uh, physical, quote unquote, inanimate objects. Uh, so in a sense, you can open the mouth of that object and sort of activate its in, innate virtues, which are uh, hierarchically uh, corresponding to that planet. You know, it's sort of, you can say it's so it has bits of the soul of the planet in it. And everything under the rulership of, of certain planets had sort of the... Uh, different aspects of that planet's 
soul or essence. Um, this is also the reason why you want to combine as much as you can from all level of correspondences to have a sort of maximize complete body or receptacle for that planet. So again, driving that point home, uh, astrological magic happens with and through the soul of the practitioner. I hope they would, wouldn't try to make an AI uh, that will try to do those things, but I'm sure they will. You know, Now there's AI doing sigils and different magical symbolism and, you know, if so it can just be done, started. it probably will be done. So we'll we'll, yeah. we'll see we'll see what what the future holds. Yeah. So, uh, what advice would you give to somebody who's interested in learning more about astral magic or getting started with their own practice? Well, I would say first of all, uh, start learning astrology. That's of course the basis. <laughs> But I would say something like this. I would say, you know, try to embody astrology in the sense of uh, sensing the uh, the different changing of your states, your mental, emotional states in correlation with certain transits or correlation with certain planets. Because in that way, you'll have an experiential reference to each of the colors, in a sense, the taste, the the tones of the different planetary aspects of your soul. And then when you go more proactive, then you can sort of uh, summon these inner references, these inner, uh, you can say, um, notes or, or qualities. And and this is, I think, a central element of astrological magic, knowing how to charge yourself with that certain uh, state. So I would say the first thing is sort of sampling and are, and sort of differentiating those different planetary powers. And, of course, you know, read what you can from ancient sources. So, are there specific so, texts that you recommend? Uh, there's not a lot of them, you know. I, I would say that the most accessible for things that have to do with, you know, with correspondences and, uh, and different types of rituals, etc., are the Picatrix and Cornelius Agrippa's uh, Natural Philosophy. Pacino's three books on life. Yes, Pacino's uh, De Vita. And um, I would also say that uh, Iamblichus song, the mysteries, uh, is not, you know, it's not astrological magic per se, but it gives us, it gives the sentiment of the theurgical sort of approach. Um, I would also warn from taking the text too literally. So this is why I, the first thing I said is, you know, go and sample the cosmos by yourself. Uh, with the aid of astrology to sort of make that link between what you see in the chart and what you feel or experience in internally or externally. When you get that association, you're starting having this gnosis feeling of, I can see everything participating in something, but everything is sort of moving, but that planetary power is sort of in the back of each of its manifestations. So in that way, you can sort of strip the manifestations and sort of have a glimpse of that essential power and sort of connect to it unconditionally to a degree. And when you have this, of course, you need the uh, to time, you know, to, to learn electional astrology, uh, to time your ritual, and uh, intentionally create things under it. Yeah, so I would say, you know, the text will give you uh, some blueprints on how to approach this and will give you the, the different um, correspondences and different technical things to look at, also intellectual-wise, etc. 
but but really the essence of the work is is the direct experience of these yeah. powers and uh, the intentional alignment with, with them and that's another important aspect intentional alignment is not only talisman making uh, everything that you can do to set the setting as a receptacle for the intended planetary power uh, could help in sort of drawing it down. Uh, so it can be certain activities. It could be, uh, you know, it could be a meditation under some certain influence. It could be uh, the creation of something which is not a jewel or a ring or, you know. Yeah, it can uh, be decorating your house in a certain way and wearing certain clothes. It can be eating certain, certain color foods. scheme. Yeah. Yes. The talisman yes. is something that has power over something. It doesn't necessarily just mean a metal object. Um, right. Yes. Right. So this is really this is really essential because this this connects it to a living wisdom and not just um, a static um, event oriented practice. Uh, in the sense of just finding windows to create talismans. Uh, the, the, the essence is continuously living in recognition and alignment uh, with the planetary powers, yeah. with, with the natural cycles of planetary powers. So also the, the cycle of the sun, the cycle of the moon, and sort of aligning your activities and gaining a sort of homeostasis with the cosmos, you can say. Uh, the only thing you need for this practice really is your soul. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, you need to learn astrology. This is, uh, uh, but, you know, some of these things are pretty intuitive, you know, uh, connecting to the sun, for instance. Uh, you don't have to know astrology for that. You can consciously accept the sun when it rises every morning and open up to its energy and uh, sort of uh, direct your will in with its power and its movement uh, by uh, act, uh, certain actions or just gratitude. Uh, you ask, how is this information relevant to modern men? Uh, and I feel that, um, you know, I believe that the reason for the revival of these kinds of wisdom traditions in our time is because we lost this connection. It's because we, we yearn for this connection again, you know. In, in the words of D.H. Lawrence, we have lost the cosmos, you know, uh, and the ecstatic connection to the living creative powers. And in this sense, I think astrology and astral participatory magic can help us, you know, reappreciate and regain our deep connection to nature and the living cosmos. Uh, so, so in a sense, this is why I think it's not only relevant, but it's sort of imperative that um, it doesn't mean we need to practice, you know, magic in the sense of talisman creations. It just means that we need to sort of, uh, we need to embody it, but in order to embody it, we need to recognize it, reappreciate it, you know, um, feel the, this, this connection. We can become participators in this cosmic uh, drama. And in this, in this sense, you know, when there are, for instance, very intensified historical surges, astrologically speaking, you know, uh, uh, either individually or collectively, when you have this knowledge, then you have more choice on how to act on it. And there's something much more nobler of course, you can you can ch choose to act on it uh, uh, in in a non positive way. That's of course an option, but you know, <clears throat> uh, if you understand the risks, understand the uh, the dangers, and you you 
consciously mitigate that and channel it and direct it to more positive uh, uh, um, ways of expression, collectively, I mean, and individually, then you can really, really get out of this unending loop um, of, you know, of, of human struggle in a sense. Yeah, escaping your fate is how the ancient Stoics would have talked about it. Um... Yeah, I, I have a little problem with that because I don't think it's escaping fate. I think it's a it's a higher completing um, fate. Actually, is how Iamblichus talks mm, about it. Yeah, he corrects Porphyry, who says, "Do you do you think that the gods unbind fate?" And he says, "No, the gods complete fate." Yes, and, this is beautiful. Yes, so in a sense, it's participating in what is fated, but in a sense, uh, directing it or navigating it to its uh, best outcome. For instance, uh, the transit of Mars can make you can make you angry and violent, for instance. Yeah, but you can, if you know this, and you do what you can not to fall into those behaviors then you can rise up above them and and still express mars but in a way that would be constructive and a way that would you know direct this power uh in a, in a positive way uh and not in, in, in states uh, and not make you know a war or you know or but of course these this is all very uh, euphemistic, you know, speaking about um, humanity in that sense, you know, uh, humanity in that sense is like very, very young children in the kindergarten pulling each other's hairs and, you know, the, like bullies, you know, the, the, we're not there yet. <laughs> and who knows if we'll get there. Um, yeah, but I think... I think we, we nostalgically speaking, we probably were there at some phases of our long history, uh, for a while at least. And now it's a matter of returning. Yes. All right. So we yeah. are about to, to run up against our, our time. And I just wanted to ask you one final question. And that is what are some of your current projects or areas of focus within astral magic and what can we expect to see from you in the future i know that you have something coming up this month yes yes we're working on it together yes <laughs> so uh on the 16th of this month i'm opening um a course on astrological magic, it's the most extensive course that um, uh, I ever did. Um, it's it's three month, twelve weekly sessions, and also has a unique collaborations with you, which uh, I'm very very happy uh, for. And David Weitzman, which is a, um, a metallurgist and talisman creator. Of you know that does this um, practically. That will happen the practical aspect, and of course, uh, J. D. Kelly, uh, which is which is a, a astrologer and um, and magician on his own right, and is also the president of the I A A M, which is the International Association of Astral Magic. He will be co-facilitating the course with me and helping me and the students. Uh, so we have a really good team and, you know, I can't wait. Uh, it's really around the corner. So, you know, I'll take this uh, opportunity, this Kairos, to invite everyone that feels drawn to this art and science and that he will have the opportunity to also hear us move deep in our collaboration on the historical aspects and the deciphering of ancient texts. So I'm really looking forward for that. First come, first serve. Yeah. All <laughs> right. Well, thank you for this very wonderful and fruitful discussion, Michael. Um, I think it was great. And thank you. Uh, please visit hermeticastrology.com to find Michael's offering for the course. 
So uh, any final comments before uh, closing off for the day? In the bottom of my website, there is a link for an article that I've written uh, about two years ago. Um, if you're interest, interested in my approach, this is a very accessible resource. It's not a very elaborate article, but it sort of brings home a lot of the things that we've talked about here. Uh, so you're also invited to read that. And that's it, really, you know. Um, All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, lovely conversation. And I'll see you again very soon. Yes, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we'll see you soon as well.